Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Questioning Behavior Podcast. My name is Marilyn van der Nakker, and as always, I am here with my much better half, Sarah Bowen. Hi, hi. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. So, Sarah, today we are actually going to talk about something which you can argue is not really behavioral science related, although it is very, very relevant for people who have been or are considering doing a PhD in behavioral science. And that is what is nicely known on Twitter as hashtag AltAc, which stands for Alternative Pathways uh, from Academia, or just Alternative Academia, if you will. Are you excited? Oh, yes, I'm very excited. I mean, anyone who's listened to any of our office hour episodes or even the first episode we did uh, knows that we are PhD students. And as a result of that, constantly thinking about and worrying about what the hell comes next after this. Um, So I think this will hopefully be an episode that will be very interesting to anyone at any level of education, undergrad, master's. PhD and beyond, um, who is, you know, doesn't really know what they want to do. And so maybe thinking a PhD is something with which they could, you know, uh, spend four years studying a topic that they like, but not really sure what's going to come next or, yeah, not really sure what that could actually lead to, which I know that was (laughs) exactly, it's perfectly describes me. I'm not sure about you. What what are your well, thoughts? Well, I mean, I've always been interested in L, uh, in alt act just in general when I started the PhD. I wasn't super grounded in one direction specifically, and I was in a cohort with, you know, a, a bunch of people who were either very adamant about yes, I'm going to be an academic and I, I hope that, you know, if that is their true dream that they succeed. But I was also there with, with a few people who from the get-go knew that they were just going to in the in, were going into industry and were using the PhD to a strategic advantage to become more competitive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I've always been quite exposed to to both modes of thinking, which was which was very convenient and and really good. But so what what does alt arc mean to you? What what do you think of when you're thinking of alt arc? Does it does it mean anything to you? Do you envision something? Um, I think just as the as the term, it just means you know doing something outside of the academy, outside of, you know, being employed by university to do research and teaching. Um, you know, I think those are the the two sort of default pathways that um, are assumed is what every PhD student wants to do next. It's like, I, you know, you want to go into a more research-based career or a teaching-based career, or people tend to think that, you know, everyone wants to be a researcher. And so if you end up doing more teaching, it's just because you've Mm. failed. Uh, And there is definitely that mindset that if you can't get through the the job market, I mean, my experience is with the economics um, job market, which is Mm -hmm. brutal, uh, but I think all of them are. Um, You know, if you can't get through that and you can't get hired, then it's just because you weren't good enough. Yeah, because you're just, you know, you're not talented enough or or things like that. Whereas I think, you know, there are so many overqualified people, so many people who would be very qualified and very good at the same jobs that it's, uh, yeah, it becomes quite a toxic environment <laughs> because there's just not enough jobs in nope, academia. So not. of course you have, you're going to have to look elsewhere. So, I mean, I like, I like the term alt-ac, although it does sort of place the mm-hmm. default choice still on, academia and and it is a bit nebulous it is anything that's not within the academy so you could still be doing research yeah, i think with an in an alt at career um but yeah i know i i like the term i, I think we should be talking about it more as a real viable yep. option and not just not just the result of an unsuccessful academic career Absolutely. I mean, I think it's interesting that you mentioned that, you know, even the term alt arc still suggests that, you know, academia, like an academic career would be the default. But I don't think that is by default the default of whomever came up with that term. I think that's just very much in line 
with what is going on in academic institutions because the academic career, although statistically not the default because most people do not end up in academic careers anymore, that is just, you know, you are being prepped for an academic career and that is essentially it. But I feel like we should dive into the interview where we are talking to Chris Cornthwaite. This is such a British name, and I think this is the first name I might actually struggle with <laughs> pronouncing. But, uh, I mean, he, he knows everything about it. He started Rooster Vane as a way of communicating to PhD students and later on, uh, you know, non-PhD students, even younger students, that there is more to life than continuing in academia or struggling to continue to uh, to be in academia, rather. So I think uh, I think we should get in the expert and uh, see what he has to say. So today we have Chris Cornthwaite with us. Hi, Chris. How are you? Um, first question, as always, is who are you? Uh, what do you do and how did you get there? Oh, my God. That's a big question. <laughs> well, I'm mm-hmm. Chris Cornthwaite, like you said. Um, I, I did a PhD in religious studies and that is not what anybody's really ever interested in about me anymore. But uh, I, I wrote Sorry. on no, that's okay. Um, I wrote on religion and uh, migration in antiquity specifically. So it's not a super sexy topic and not something I talk much about anymore. And I'm frankly I'm okay oh. with that. Actually, that's the funny thing about doing okay. funner things after your PhD is you don't really care anymore. Um, yeah. So I uh, after my PhD, I, I um, moved to Ottawa, which is the capital city of Canada, which is where I live now. I'm Canadian. Maybe uh, some people might be able to tell by the accent. And I, yeah, I moved to Ottawa and I didn't really know what I was going to do with my PhD. I I didn't really think there was anything I could do with my PhD. And um, the department I went to was one of those ones. We we had a little bit, there's a little bit of talk about non-academic work, but most of the focus was on, was on, um, you know, getting a tenure track job or other roles within academia. So I, I just didn't know. I didn't know what I could do. I moved to Ottawa. And I started meeting people, I started networking, and I had had interview to be a realtor at one point, selling houses. I had an interview. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking I was <laughs> going to be working construction for a little while, which was what I did before my PhD, seemed like a step backwards. But um, eventually I ended up in the world of public policy. So I got hired for a Canadian think tank. Um, so I was running mm-hmm. kind of big projects in um, economic development, Canadian competitiveness, and um, also a subject that's really, I mean, it's important everywhere, but it's, it's specifically really a vital conversation here in Canada, which is Indigenous reconciliation. Um, mm-hmm. So I was running these big projects and meeting all these interesting people and a lot of people leading in government, leading in companies, leading in um, the nonprofit sector. And a lot of them had PhDs and a lot of them had interesting academic backgrounds. And that was kind of my first my first kind of realization was actually there's a lot you can do with this, a lot of interesting things that aren't academia. And then the next question was, why the hell didn't anybody tell me this? <laughs> why, <laughs> why did I yeah. think that it was just going to be misery after? Um, so I worked I worked in public policy. I, uh, I ended up working for the Canadian government um, on uh, a program that teaches other countries how to do um, refugee sponsorship, actually, which is uh, mm-hmm. was really interesting kind of connection to international relations. And I was working a lot with the UNHCR and I worked with the UK, with the Home Office, worked with different people around the world. Um, so it was really it was really cool. And I, I just I, I kept coming back to that question of like, how come nobody's telling students what to do? And I would even go sit at these kind of high level policy uh, roundtables with a lot of, you know, quote unquote, important people in the Canadian context. And they would talk about education and underemployment and all these issues that are facing not just PhDs, but a lot of a lot of graduate cohorts. And they would talk about all these issues, but it would just never go anywhere. It was just kind of this navel gazing policy talk that was really nice. And they'd write a report that nobody read. <laughs> Nothing ever changed. So um, so. What ended up happening, I, I loved blogging and I had done a presentation at my former department on how to get a job with a PhD and talked about all the options for humanities PhDs. And they asked me to start a blog. So I started Rooster Vane just kind of on a Sunday. I threw up a post. I don't think anybody read it for four or five months. Um, and then, on, well, no, it's okay. I, wasn't, <laughs> I, didn't cry, I didn't cry in my room or anything, but I had, I had done it. You know, I, I did what uh, sure. I, I put the information up there that I knew. And then it, uh, yeah, it took off an academic chatter a few months later and, you know, a ton of mm-hmm. people started reading it. People started asking questions. Okay. What do I do? How do I turn my CV into a resume? What kind of jobs can mm-hmm. I get with X degree? 
Um, so I just started blogging about it and that's what I've been doing ever since. And it's grown a following and it's not like, I, I do have some imposter syndrome about, uh, about being a careers person because it's not, I mean, I've never worked in HR. I've never mm -hmm. like really my sure. advice comes from just doing it right. And, and talking to a lot of mm -hmm. people who have done it. And, uh, to my relief, the more I talk to people and now I've interviewed, you know, dozens of PhDs who have left and are doing all sorts of interesting things, not just in Canada, but across the world. And to my relief, most of my advice is pretty, <laughs> pretty universal. And I, a lot of the, I hear the same kind of stories again and again. So that's, that's my kind of long, long answer to who I am and, and what I do. Okay. Excellent. But then I'm quite curious, where does the name Rooster Vane come from? I've always wondered that. There's no, there's no good reason other than that. I d didn't really oh. think anyone was ever going to read the blog. I was trying to, I was trying <laughs> to find a domain name that was available. Um, so I, I was thinking of like direction, like, you know, like a weather vane where, it, you know, it turns with the yeah. wind and tells you which way the wind's blowing. And I thought that's kind of a nice image for direction. Um, there's a rooster on top of a lot of them. And I had a, it was my like camp name when I worked at camp as a teenager, I was rooster. So I was like, oh, rooster vane <laughs> domain was available. Was I liked that it was .com. I guess it was meant to be and for better or for worse, I'm stuck with it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it has definitely, you know, like you said, grown a following. It's become very, very popular. So it, it's a name that sticks. It's, it, it's, it's short, it's catchy, and you've got no clue what it's no about. Clue, so it's and it's memorable. Oh, yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if I want to go start selling something totally different tomorrow, or, you know, it, nobody would even know. <laughs> yeah. Nope. yeah. Excellent. I mean, so, you know, we are both PhD students who have got no idea what we're going to do with our lives beyond um, just doing everything we can to submit the thesis right now, which seems like a long, a long and arduous uphill challenge. Um, but yes. So, I mean, this is like super fascinating to me because I, my experience echoes very similar to, to your experience and that the only sort of career careers that are talked about or the sort of assumed next step is that you go into yeah. academia after all of this. So, I mean, mm. um, what what would be your advice to someone in our position right now? Where should we be looking like to get inspiration for alt academic careers? Because right now I don't even have a picture in my mind of what I could I be yeah. doing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think that's a really common problem. And I think like if you asked me when I was still in my PhD what an alt act career was, I would think writing or editing maybe <laughs> you know i might i might sure. have thought nonprofit, probably not and i didn't really want to do university administration because i was kind of pissed at the university when i left so i was like i don't want to come work for you for a quarter of what i would make as a professor or whatever now mind mm -hmm. you some people in admin make a lot more as i now realize but i don't think i knew that at the time <laughs> um i mean i think i think the first step like the first thing I want to say is I think there's a mind, a mindset shift that needs to take place. And, and this is just kind of universal in academia that we need to change the way we talk about these degrees if we're going to keep letting people do them, because it's frankly not fair to keep recruiting students for jobs that don't exist. And in academia, in most fields, mm -hmm. I, I don't offhand know the, know the numbers for um, behavioral science, but in the vast majority of fields, you know, the vast majority of PhDs will not be tenure track professors. So Oh, no, absolutely not. Yeah. So so calling it Alt-Ac or even calling it Plan B, which some people do, it's just it's not even realistic. It's most people. It's their plan A. And so I, I just want to see a change of um, I want to see a change in the narrative, first and foremost. And I think what that does, c coming back to your question, is I think I think if you start to shift your mindset towards like this this degree can take me anywhere. And it really can. It really, really can take you just about anywhere, but not by itself. You know, like nobody's just going to come and hand you an amazing career because you have a PhD. But if you can combine it with your own leadership abilities and grow some, grow some areas that you need to grow and like basically just take almost an entrepreneurial approach to your career, you can go just about anywhere. And as for finding direction, I mean... Kind of two things. The one I always come back to is networking. It really is like just reach out to strangers on LinkedIn or if you know people, ask your professors for introductions. If you're on good terms, you can say, you know, if you're if you're doing behavioral science or there's lots of interesting corporate routes you could take with that. Like there's lots of mm -hmm. um, lots. Frankly, behavioral science is a pretty sexy field right now. So I think there's a lot like there's well, a lot you can do with that in quote unquote alt -ac. And the best way to find out is just to go and find people who are doing it. So alumni might be a great place to look, like who's graduated from your program and just reach out. And I mean, 
it takes a bit of courage to do that. But in my experiences, I've had, you know, I've had people ignore me, sure, but I've often had very good responses. And uh, most of the opportunities and connections I've had have come from reaching out to people I didn't know and having a conversation. So it it really does take that. But you're going to start to see what will inevitably happen is with each conversation, like it's almost like a puzzle, you know, like when you look at a puzzle all like on the table dumped out with it without being put together, you can't actually tell what it's going to be. I guess you have the box, but if you couldn't, if you didn't know what it would look like, you just <laughs> yeah. start putting, you just start putting it together, you know, and each conversation is going to be like a piece of that puzzle. And even by the time you're done your PhD, you won't know everything you can do with it, but you might know enough to take a first step. And that first step will lead to another first step. And even for me, like when I look back at when I finished my PhD, it wasn't like, I I still didn't know what I know now, you know, like each year has come with progressive learning, understanding about my options, like knowing more and more about the world, but you just, you just need to see enough in front of you that you can take the next step, you know? And I think that's really, that's kind of the way to approach it. And it's just networking is going to open those, uh, open those doors for sure. Yeah, mm. I'm not surprised that you mentioned networking. Uh, this, this is whether you want to stay in academia or you don't yeah, want to stay in true, academia. Yeah. You, you can't, you can't really escape networking. Yeah. Uh, like you said, the idea that you know you just happen to be brilliant as a PhD student and you publish everything you've ever done, even that just does not guarantee you a job. Uh, if the research lab doesn't know you, uh, that's just not how these worlds work. But when it comes to networking, once you have realized very clearly that you don't want to remain in academia for, for whatever reason. I think all reasons are, are valid with regards to that choice. It's very different representing yourself as a PhD student to corporate, mm. to nonprofit and to uh, fellow academics. Do you think maybe a lot of people struggle with this, this change because it is very difficult to establish your professional identity as a PhD student? It, it definitely can. There are kind of two ways I think about it. Like on the one hand, um, on the one hand, I think you don't really want to go out to the world outside of academia and start talking about the intricacies of your dissertation, you know, which is unfortunately what some <laughs> people do. Um, yeah. So I do think there is, I, like, I think you're in learning mode, you know, when you're looking beyond academia, you're really just more asking questions than I, I think. I mean, every conversation I ever had my as I was leaving academia usually started with, you know, I, I would tell people I did a PhD in religion and migration. And that was kind of enough. And it was even especially since this was a couple of years ago. I mean, well, even now migration is still, it's very important, but um, yeah, religion migration, it kind of like connected with some people in a way, like they could see the policy implications for, especially for immigration. And the other thing I said sometimes, which is funny because as I was writing my PhD, I ended up putting in a chapter on new institutional economics and on kind of trust oh. networks and the way that religion can cement together trade. Um, so I would even sometimes say it's a little sneaky, but it wasn't, it wasn't a lie. Like I would, I would sometimes say like, <laughs> oh, I did, you know, a little bit in like economics or a little bit in, you know, trade or something like that. And there, there is, I mean, there is a full chapter of my PhD, but I'm obviously not an economist. Um, but those little, like nobody expects you to be an economist if you just, you know, I just, but it just connects like in their mind. Like, I wasn't applying for jobs mm-hmm. as an economist, but, um, all that to say that it was just ways of presenting myself that I think like I thought at the time would make a little bit of sense to people. And very few people ever asked me to go into more detail. <laughs> it was usually like, that's great. Okay. Well, let me tell you about what I do. Right. And uh, mm-hmm. I think if I had met people and started talking about, you know, the, all the ancient rituals and deities that I studied, I think I would have lost people pretty quickly. So I think that I think that's the right way to do it. Um, But the other thing I would say is, I think, like this idea that people outside of academia don't know what it's like, what academia is like. um, Mm -hmm. I found that's often a myth. Like, it's very interesting. I think that's true. Like, you know, if you were in a city in the Midwest US, and you're trying to get hired in the steel industry or something, like, no kidding, people would not understand if you go and start talking about your dissertation. But here in Ottawa, with it's a knowledge economy, it's got the highest mm-hmm. percentage of PhDs in Canada. Um, oh. I frequently I sat down with somebody who either had a PhD themselves, had thought about a PhD. I met a lot of people who started PhDs and left because they got better jobs and they just didn't want to stay and finish it. Um, so, yeah, like I think I think the assumption and especially as I work in policy now, there are a lot of strings in this in this city in particular, but it would be true of Washington or London or anywhere. Um, there are a lot of sure. strings between academia and 
the political community, the policy community. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's the other thing to count on is that it may not be as foreign to people as you think. Like it may, there may be, you may meet a lot of people, especially if you're going for talking to alumni or something, you'll meet people who sort of mm -hmm. understand where you're coming from and they'll probably be okay with it. Thanks. Well, that's optimistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that is optimistic. <laughs> And I'm I'm wondering with with obviously the the benefit of hindsight, do you find that actually the stuff that you developed during your PhD, like the sort of skill sets you developed, have they had sort of a direct influence on what you do day to day now, or has it been a, almost a complete transition um, into something new? That's a good question. I think. Yeah, I, I definitely developed skills during my PhD that were transferable and that have taken me places. I don't think I would give my PhD as much credit for success as, you know, maybe my department might like me or, you know, departments might like to give <laughs> their students sure, um, or to take the credit for it. Because it's really not like my PhD didn't actively prepare me for anything other than academia and the points where it accidentally prepared me for things. You know, I'm, I'm a much better writer now. I could write. I could write okay when I started my PhD. Um, by the time I finished, I was better because I'd gone through five or six years of having my writing ripped apart. And, you know, like, and that practice for anybody is good. Um, you don't mm -hmm. need to do it. I feel that pain though. Yes. I relate to this. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And you don't need a PhD to get that. I mean, you could join yeah. a writing group and get that, you know, but that was one thing. Um, my ability to research and synthesize information, I realized, um, just, I think one of the things I realized pretty quick is how much faster I could produce things than other people could, that mm. somebody would say, like when I was working for the government, it would, it would be, you know, write a five page policy brief and I could do that in three or four hours and it would be like solid prose and somebody else, it would take them a week, you know? So it's, mm -hmm. it's not, and maybe that's just personality too, um, I mean, I do find that some people are just inherently better writers than others. And it, it is be, quite yeah. difficult to to succinctly put your words to paper. I just know the difference between my and Sarah's writing styles. And it's, <laughs> I, I feel like the, the policy challenge would affect us both very differently. <laughs> I feel like I'm being thrown under the bus here for my writing skills. Thanks. Thanks, mate. Absolutely not. Because <laughs> no, first of all, I didn't say names. And second of all, you are much better at coding than I am. So if we had three hours to code up a re like a convincing result, you know, the, the win would go without a doubt to Sarah, without <laughs> a doubt. Different skill sets, right? Different skill sets. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And I mean, it may not be universal all PhDs, but that was that was my story. Um, hmm. but as to the question of whether, like, I think honestly, the biggest thing my PhD gave me was a brand. Like it gave me in a knowledge economy, <laughs> having a PhD, it means something. And I'll never forget the first day when I was hired at the government that my manager or whatever was walking me around, introducing me to people and saying, this is Chris. He has a PhD. <laughs> and <laughs> wow. nobody ever asked. What an nobody cared. Nobody asked. But in his mind, that meant that I was a brain, you know, like a powerhouse brain mm -hmm. on his team. Whether I was that or not, I don't know. Sometimes I don't think I'm <laughs> much of a powerhouse <laughs> brain as maybe he wanted me to be. But um, the point is, is like... It's all about perception. Perception, exactly. reputation. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That, but that's interesting. It's almost like social capital. Like it is you gain exactly. that yeah. in the outside world, yeah. Yeah, you, people take what you say as an expert opinion, even if you don't know what you're talking about. Which is <laughs> the best. That's I'm the not, best not saying about you, Chris, personally. No, it's okay. It's not true of me personally yeah. too. But um, yeah, it's no, it, it's really true. I, I would say social capital is exactly the way to put it, and I don't think, I don't think people realize that, and it, it wouldn't be true of all PhDs, you know. Like if I. Um, I'm trying to say this nicely, but like I'm, I'm fairly outgoing, fairly personable. Um, and I think a lot of the PhDs I meet in Ottawa who are very high up are those types of people because they're working in policy, but they're building relationships or, you know, doing a lot of, you know, outreach work or politics or whatever it is. Um, so I think that I think that that's kind of it. There's still personality in it, I guess, is what I'm saying. But I, I do think it definitely is a boost for social mm. capital, for sure. Especially, again, in a knowledge economy city. It wouldn't get you very far in the in the steel company, to pick on the steel company again. But uh, in in policy, in you know, public relations, things like that, it, it can go places. Especially in, like, research institutions or, you know, like, like commercial research institutions. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I've never thought about a PhD as a brand before or a way of... of 
I guess, I don't know, marketing yourself or some. I mean, social capital has crossed my mind before. Like the way that you, if you tell people I'm studying for a PhD, there is like a reaction to that of, oh gosh, you must be very smart. I'm like, that's <laughs> yeah. not true at all. <laughs> but um, yeah, but that's interesting. I mean, is is that sort of the advice that you that you would give people who are currently in their PhDs right now to start thinking about their PhD as a brand and how they want to develop themselves I and the PhD as a brand? I think so. I mean, it, it, it depends what people want, right? Like there mm -hmm. are, there are PhDs who, you know, to, to go back to the government, I, I knew somebody else who had a PhD in government who just wanted to work on the, on the database and crunch, mm -hmm. crunch numbers all day, you know, and that's, that's fine. If that's what you want to do. Um, I, I, I don't think I, I was having a conversation with somebody else in a podcast about this a while ago, but I didn't love research. I didn't love like that part of academia. I could do it and I, I did it, but it wasn't like, I didn't come to the end of it and I was like, I just want to sit and research for the rest of my life and never do anything else. It was like, I never want to read another book as long as I live. <laughs> <It's kind> of, <laughs> that's how yeah, I felt that's... by the time I was done my PhD. So I think, yeah, I think it, it just kind of depends what you want. But if you want to think of your PhD as a brand and if you want to, specifically if you want to be a leader, and I'll tell you that when you move into a leadership position with a PhD, you make a lot more money. Um, then if you, you know, sit, if you have a job where you're kind of always told to do by somebody or told what to do by somebody else, no, we do always answer to people. But as you get into leadership positions, that's where your PhD, the combination of social capital, but if you can build a complementary skill set that would include those leadership and management and maybe, you know, maybe budgeting, maybe project management, management, maybe like skills that actually make sense for a leader, you can actually leverage your PhD into quite a lot of money. And that's where if you hear about PhDs going to work for McKinsey or something like that, like those are, that's exactly what that looks like, but it doesn't have to be McKinsey. It could be a lot of different places. So, so I find this quite interesting because the, the work that you currently do still, I can see why it would align with your PhD, but in hindsight, given that, you know, you left and you were pissed at the university, uh, which you've mentioned yourself <laughs> is, and you know, you've, You've already said that in hindsight, the PhD, if it prepared you at all for what you're currently doing, it was by accident. So in hindsight, would you still have done the PhD? Or do you think there was something else you could have done that would have gotten you to a better place or just a different place? There, It's interesting to think about because where I was when I started the PhD, I mean, I did, I did a master's degree first. Um, Canada has a similar system to the UK in that regards. It's very like you do a master's, not a PhD. Mm -hmm. um, so I did my master's degree first, but before that I was working as a landscaper making, you know, $30,000 a year or something like that. Like I wasn't, I, and my life was just going to be that if it sure. wasn't for, if it wasn't for the fact that I went into academia. So it's tough to say, like, I don't know sure. what that, what that transition into my, I'm now 35. So let's say between 25 and 35, I was pretty much in, in school. Mm -hmm. I had taken some time off and worked before that kind of in the middle of my undergrad. Um, so I don't know what that transition would have looked like in those 10 years. Would I still be in landscaping? Obviously, I have no idea. I'd like to think probably not, but I don't know. Maybe mm -hmm. I would have started my own company and been more wealthy and successful than I am now. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um all that to say that I think my short answer is yes, I would do a PhD again. And that wasn't what I would say last year. It wasn't what I would say when I came out of academia. Um, the further the further that I go, the more I can see the benefit. Um, however, that's not just to say, and I don't want, especially if there are people in like university leadership listening to this, I don't want them to just think that I'm saying a PhD is just worth it at all costs. If I were to do the PhD again, knowing what I know now, I would do a lot more in policy. I would work a lot more like, like for example, right now I work in um, work a lot in refugee policy and some of my consulting work. Um, so, you know, I could do a PhD in, in immigration policy and build connections with the UNHCR or with NGOs or, or like, I, I know now how I should have done my PhD, but it took me some time to get there. Sure. Um, so I think, yeah, hindsight's 2020, mm -hmm. but I, I would do it again, but I would do it better. And I think that's why that's one of the reasons why I give the advice I give is because people don't have to go through the mistakes that I that I made necessarily and, you know, and, and try to figure it out over all these years. If people just know, like, here's what you should be doing in your PhD to set you up after. I think that's it's uh, yeah, definitely makes the transition a little more easy. Absolutely.
So what, from your perspective, ab about your story, what was your biggest mistake, would you say? And how would you have gone about fixing it, you know, in hindsight? <laughs> I think my biggest mistake was just pretending that I was going to be different than everybody else. And a lot oh. of PhDs do this. Pretending that I'm going to get an academic job, mm -mm. so I don't have to think about networking. I don't have to, like, I'll do all that if and when, at some point down the road, if and when I get rejections from all my academic jobs, I will start to think about a non-academic career. And that's what happened. I got, you know, I went in the job market for two cycles. And, and by that point, I was out of money and I didn't really want to move. I have a family, so I didn't want to move to a new place to start a postdoc for a year or two or whatever. So I was just out of options. And that's the point when I turned and said, okay, it's time to figure this out. And then it took me, you know, six months to a year before I got a little bit of traction. And then I started from there, it, it kind of the ball was rolling metaphorically. Um, so I think that's, that's my biggest mistake is just what most people do. A lot of PhD students do this. They think I'm going to get an academic job. I'm going to be the exception. If I publish enough, if I, you know, present enough conferences, maybe even if I network enough, whatever, if I haven't, if I have enough check marks in the box, I'm going to be the exception to the rule. And the thing that I try to say to people as gently as possible is no, you probably won't. Now, there's that little hint of thing. And that's what like screws so many people over because they just hold on to that tiny little thread that you might be the one in 100 that gets a tenure track job, you know, but mm -hmm. the odds are very much not in your favor, no matter how good you are, no matter what school you went to, no matter who your supervisor was, it's likely not going to happen. And bonus, if I knowing what I know now, I would not want a tenure track job. Like I make more money. I enjoy what I do more. I, there's no way that right now I would go back into a tenure track job if I was offered one. Um, so I think that's that's the irony too, is that the thing you're chasing might not even be as good as you think it is. <laughs> I, okay. interviewed, uh, I interviewed Lindy Ledahowski. Um, she, she runs a startup called Essay Jack. And she's got a really interesting story because she was actually a tenure track English professor. Mm. And she started her job and she hated it. She realized that all the fun of the PhD and the chase and the excitement just transforms into this monotonous year after year, teaching the same courses, doing the same things. And she she jumped ship and she went and did consulting and now she runs a ed tech startup. So that's that's the other thing too, is you never know if you're going to like being the tenure track professor as much as you think you will, right? So yeah, anyways. Yeah, but you know, given how long and some can argue exploitative that track is to get to a tenure track job, you better make damn sure that you want it because the opportunity oh, cost yeah. here is is immensely high. It's huge. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, it's, it's massively romanticized mm -hmm. as well, isn't it? Of just like, you know, that is, you know, it's just assumed that that, of course, that's what you want to do. Yeah. Because, you know, all, everyone is, is working towards the same goal. And if you just get to this next step, then all of this stress will fall away. And it's just, no, it just keeps going. Like yeah. people I know who transition from PhD to postdoc or postdoc to assistant professor. And they're like, no, there's, there's no breathing room. It's not like mm -hmm. I'll just get to the next step and I've made yeah. it. It's yeah. like you are on that treadmill and the they keep putting the speed up. That's exactly <laughs> it's not yeah. like it's taken anything off. Because yeah, that distance so. gets longer and longer. You know, the like, now it's two postdocs you need. Now it's three postdocs before you, you yeah. know, and now, oh, we don't want anybody with a postdoc. We want somebody who just graduated because that's sexier, you know, and it's just like, yeah, you just can't, there's no you can't end win. to it. So <laughs> initially, I feel like, you know, maybe 20 years ago, you, you could still be a professor by age 40 to 35. Now you can't even become a professor before 40. There's just no way in hell. So yeah. they, yeah. just like Sarah said, you know, they, they increase the speed, but they also increase the distance and suddenly you're marathon sprinting, which I just <laughs> cannot do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good way not, to put it. Not everyone can do a four hour marathon. Exactly. Or was it, or was it yeah. a two hour marathon? What was the world record? I think it's four, but I'm What's not, it four? Okay. I'm not an I was avid like, runner. Two hours kinda... feels like, <laughs> like very fast. 40 yeah, kilometers, okay. two hours. Good luck. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's definitely not right. Did no. it on that. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah. but that's exactly what the academia feels like. It's just, you know, you do the mathematics, you do the calculations, and you're just like, yeah, there's just something not right here. It's just, this does not yeah. add up. <laughs> and I think it's important to ask, what are you chasing? You know, like, instead of chasing this nebulous thing of a tenure track job, and then I'll be happy. Like, what is it about that that you want? Like, some people want to be teachers. I didn't actually really want to be a teacher. 
So I, I, I do you know, love I'm, this. Sorry to interrupt, but you think yeah, about during your PhD that you're not really keen on teaching and you're not actually keen on research. So I have to ask, <laughs> why did you what do a was PhD? It that you wanted to do? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. And, and I think it's one that I need to work out in the psychologist couch more than anything. But um, <laughs> I, I did a PhD like a lot of people. I did a PhD because I didn't know what to do with my master's degree. That's like the Very short honest. answer Very to honest. a really to a really shitty paradigm that when people finish bachelor's degrees, they don't know what to do. And if they're smart, their professors tell them, you're really smart. You should go do a master's degree. Mm -hmm. I was just watching Karen Kelsky's TED Talk. I don't know if you've seen it. Not it's yet. worth watching. But she was talking about exactly this. And it's so true that the curse of being the best student in your class in undergrad is that you're going to be told inevitably you should go do a master's degree. Or you, even if it's in the States, you might go straight to a PhD program. Sure. And it's, it's just that's the curse is you just keep going because you don't know what else to do. And I think also it's one of the things I think all the time about sharing careers is like, I do, I do blog a lot about PhDs, but more and more I'm trying to just get advice to undergraduates because if there were more undergraduates who knew how to build a great career with their undergraduate degree, they wouldn't be going for PhDs that they have no idea what they're going to do with. Sure. So the thing that appealed to me about the PhD, my professor was that my supervisor, um, he traveled around the world. He would go to Paris for a conference over the weekend and be back the next week. Um, he, you know, oh, went those days, those all days. these years. Yeah, those were good. <laughs> those. Um, you know, he'd be in the, the archives in Germany one week and then, you know, and that was the life I wanted for me. I wanted to travel. And to me, the, the basic two things I wanted, I wanted to work from everywhere, anywhere, and I wanted to travel and I wanted to do work that kind of stimulated me intellectually. You know, it didn't have to be research at the time when I was in my PhD, for what it's worth, I still enjoyed research. It was by the time I got to the end, I was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. Um, so I still did in my PhD. I was attracted to the idea of research. Um, I'm just not anymore. So, but I, I traveled, you know, in my PhD, I got a bunch of extra funding and I lived in Berlin. I lived in Nice in the South of France. I lived in Athens and I, that was the best part of my PhD. And that's the other reason I don't regret it is because I didn't sit in a basement in Toronto in Canada and like, you know, sit in darkness and write for five years and come out and go to the stacks, which is what, you know, a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. um, I was, you know, hanging around the Greek islands and going down to Austria for Christmas and climbing the, the Alps. And it was, it sounds like, and I, in retrospect, I can't even believe I did that, but the funding was there to do it. Like there was so oh. much travel funding for my department. I don't know if not, not every school is like this, unfortunately, but my school had a ton of travel funding and not a lot of people took advantage. So I got paid to go travel. It was just, it was like the Excellent. perfect storm. Amazing. Yeah. So that's, again, that's like another reason why I don't regret it because I have all these great memories and I wouldn't trade those for anything, you know? So I, I wanted to go back to, to something that you've mentioned earlier. So, you know, initially you started out giving a lot of advice to PhDs, which obviously makes, makes sense. But then, you know, as you start to realize uh, how the educational system actually works and, you know, sometimes just works against the people that are in it, you've realized that you probably already need to target, uh, target sounds like uh, way too aggressive, but you probably also need to reach out and, and help out the, the undergrads. So mm. how is it different from advising PhD students? Like what, what exactly can you tell an undergrad, you know, as in maybe the PhD isn't for you, which is a very odd statement to make if as an undergrad, you haven't even considered doing a PhD. So uh, how, how is this different and, and what can you actually help them with? I guess one reason why I started it's not fundamentally different. That's part of the okay. problem. And one of the reasons why I was wondering why I'm going to keep just talking to PhDs because I would have people with master's degrees reach out and say, I have, I'm in a master's program, but I'm following your advice and it's good. And then I had bachelor people in bachelor's degrees saying, you know, I've tried networking and it's made a huge difference. And that's, I think that's why my vision for rooster Bain is bigger than PhDs because it's not fundamentally, the advice is no different. Like okay. it's, there are small, you know, there are small differences, PhDs. I think PhDs just have more of the same things, you know. So somebody who graduates with an English degree is probably a decent writer and editor and researcher. Somebody with a PhD might be, a, you know, marginally better researcher and editor and researcher. What did I say? Writer, research, editor. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not fundamentally, it doesn't fundamentally change your skill set. You know, there, there might, there are probably exceptions to this, like in some fields where you might, you know, maybe you do, I'm trying to think of an example, but um, like in PhDs where you get into actually creating like a hard science project of some sort, or you actually get to do the application and then, 
then in, in addition to like the knowledge you gain in your undergraduate, you have a project to show for it or you coded something or whatever. Right. Um, so I think this is probably my humanities paradigm talking a little bit, but mm -hmm. Yeah, fundamentally, a lot of the skills are, are transferable. The one thing undergraduates can do a little bit easier, which is great, is internships. So mm -hmm. I think that's um, like people who do internships in, in undergraduates, the vast majority of them get hired by those companies. And then, you know, whether they stay there or not, they've got some work experience on their resume, which is the hardest thing to get. The first job is often the hardest. Sure. And then you're kind of off to the races and you can build your career. So I think maybe that's one way, not that PhDs can't do internships, but it's I haven't met a lot of PhDs who want to or, or do. Um, and frankly, I don't know that they have to. It might, if I was really desperate and I had no job options, I might consider it. But um, I don't know. This is hard. I'm, I'm saying a lot of generalities here and there are a lot of field dependent things too. So oh, of course. like if I were a data scientist and I got an internship at Google, I would go do that, you know, yeah, <laughs> even if I was a PhD student. So it's, it's hard to generalize, but um, yeah, I think those are some of the, some of the differences. I, I do think there, there's quite a, a location bias here as well, because I know several yeah. people in the UK during the PhD who have done internships. Uh, actually, I met, I know a statistician who's worked for Google and Facebook and, and Amazon. He's just so internship focused. I'm still not entirely sure why he's still on the PhD. <laughs> After a while, you do wonder. Uh, but yeah, Sarah, for example, Sarah here has also done an internship for Public Health England. Oh, nice. Be yeah. Because that makes sense for, for her domain. Um, I know someone yeah. who's on an internship with the OECD uh, because they, they're they actually more in like macro finance. So it made, made sense at the state at the time. Um, yeah. So I think maybe in the UK, it, it's more common. Um, it's possible. I think, I don't actually think it's more common. I think I just didn't do a very good job of, of talking about it. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm kind of thinking about like, it's true. There's a whole range of internships. And if you get an internship at the UN, or if you get an internship at the European Commission, or, or you know, the, the, a government agency, especially while you're still studying, mm. um, I think that's fantastic. So I, I think I should add some nuance here because I, I'm really talking a little too like black and white. I think um, I'm more thinking of like really undergraduate entry level internships sure, that they sure, have sure. at they have at a lot of a lot of companies hire out of internship programs. So when you have an undergraduate, you could go work for um, you know a bank or something, and you really will probably start by getting coffee and organizing papers and things like that. So that's very different than an internship at a reputable public policy organization that you're actually going to be getting your feet wet in health policy. Like that's a very sure. different story. So I think I want to backtrack on what I just said, if you can, <laughs> of course, <laughs> and add, add that addendum. But yeah, exactly. Not all internships are created the same, um, and I think especially in Europe with the with the amount of um of access i know this maybe not be true in the uk anymore but with the amount of access to the european agencies like like the uh, the ec for example i know does some great internships so there's a lot of there are a lot of great options for international organizations um i mean you could just go to geneva and hit 15 of them at once or brussels or something so <laughs> i think yeah i think internships that have a meaningful connection to somewhere that you might want to end up can be fantastic well, good to know, Sarah. You didn't waste your time. <laughs> Oof, yeah, no, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't want to scare you there. I'm sorry. That no, was... no, 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 not at all. Um, yeah, no, my internship was maybe one of the best three months of my PhD yeah. so far. So I think that's that's kind of telling. Well, I don't know whether it's just because it was a change of pace as well and proved that I could work outside of this environment to mm -hmm. myself. Well, I was I was just going to say, and hopefully, like coming back to what we were talking about earlier with like, what can you do with a PhD? Hopefully it gave you a bit more of a sense of some of the options, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think I was pleasantly surprised about how much like research-based thinking and writing and data yeah. analysis I could do, yeah. but, but I didn't have to be chasing this tenure track um, position. So... Yeah, so that was that was good good for me. Um, I mean, I I have a question about networking because um, yeah, sure. I I know that you mentioned earlier earlier as well that you suffer from imposter syndrome, and I'm I think everyone in who has done a most, PhD most of us do, yeah. Oh, it's it's a, a symptom of doing the PhD. I think you develop it um, yeah. <laughs> quite quickly. Also, but, being told you're never good enough, and <laughs> oh, that's great. I wake and that up. You're not going to get the thing you're chasing, anyways. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but yeah. you should still it's aim like... for it because that's the point of the PhD. Yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> negative affirmations; like they just do wonders for your your yeah. self, sense of self worth. Absolutely. Um, but I mean, if you think about academic networking, conferences are a great place to go and meet people. But yeah. I mean, is there 
an equivalent to like meetups that happen with people you can find people who are like-minded outside of academia i think if that was a, a resource i think and and was commonly known i mean i would definitely jump at the opportunity absolutely i'm signing up as we speak well it it does exist um yeah, so I mean, in terms of one-on-one -on -one networking, I would just mention Smart Tribe, which is actually a, a UK-based startup, and they make connections between PhDs and industry just for conversations. Yeah, so I think the one-on-one -on -one things are often easier for people, more accessible. Um, a lot of people mm -hmm. walking into a conference where they don't know anybody, not everybody's going to be able to network in that environment. I think mm -hmm. that's what most people think of when they think of networking, but it's actually really, um, it's kind of intimidating. However, if you're the kind of person who wants to do it and, and take a shot, you never know what will happen. I mean, you can drop in on any number of conferences. Before the, before the pandemic, we had, I live in Ottawa, sure. so I could have gone to a policy conference or to a political science conference, you know, whatever, whatever I was interested in. Um, just find what's happening. Google conferences in your town. And if you're once assuming they come back again, which I think they will, um, just drop in. But now I think even more so that everything's online, when you... Like if you follow some interesting organizations on LinkedIn or whatever, I see I see conferences every day on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and they're all it's it's frankly kind of conference fatigue because everything's sitting in front of Zoom for three hours. But still, I mean, if you want to go and sometimes there are breakout rooms and you never know what you'll learn. Right. And the beauty of it is a lot of these things are free now. So you can literally just go and drop in on whatever conference and listen for a while. And if it sucks, turn it off or do something else while you're listening or whatever. Um and then, yeah, you may, may get a chance to talk to interesting people, too. Or you could always, in that in that case, you could always reach out to somebody after, you know, a speaker or something and say, I heard you speak and this was interesting and could we have a chat? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's worth, worth a shot. So I think the thing about networking is there's no one way to do it. There's just, you're going to find what works for you. And some people are introverts and the most they would ever get is maybe maybe being introduced to somebody by their supervisor or something. Um, some people are a little more extroverted and can take some of these kind of social risks mm -hmm. of, you know, going to a conference, talking to a stranger. I used to walk into organizations and usually I'd get stopped at a, at a receptionist, but um, still, I mean, I, I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty bold. I put myself out there a lot um, when I was starting out. Um, I even cold called a director general in the Canadian government, which is like the equivalent of cold calling a CEO of a corporation and, um, yeah. And I, I got him on the phone and, and said I was looking for a job. And he basically nice. was like, I didn't even know what it was at the time. And now I know how ridiculous that is. But um, <laughs> whatever, you know, I make a lot of mistakes and you, you learn from them. So I, I don't buy I, I just can't imagine this one being the worst mistake. I mean, worst case scenario, you have a good anecdote. <laughs> Exactly, mm. which which I just used. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah, every every introvert needs to just latch on to an extrovert to yeah. take them around yeah, that conferences. <laughs> that's that's actually Mella is very good at that. I'll often follow Mella behind, and she'll have conversations and introduce me. I'm like, <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, that's like, girl used. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's the business idea that we need. You could start a platform where introverts could pay extroverts to follow them around at conferences and get introduced. There you go. Oh my gosh! Yeah, there's money in that for sure. Like the value I could bring to introverts' lives <laughs> would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Why does Bella. this just feel like an intellectual <laughs> escort service? This is. Uh... <laughs> oh yeah, when you put it that way, that's true. Yeah, when you put well, it that way, you know, yeah. with an eye on the marketing tactics here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no money has changed hands, Miller. It's not, it's not an escort service yet. This does not make it better <laughs> at all. Anyway, c c moving back from this ridiculous business idea, as, as we're, we're closing up to the end of this conversation. So, Chris, normally we ask people, you know, within their respective field or subfield of behavioral science, where do you think this is going in the next five to ten years? But then, for you, I would like to pose the question: Given the um, many current issues within academia and the fact that you know the the alt -arc sector is just growing which is not surprising given that most people in phds can actually go into a tenure track academic job where do you see both of these sectors going in the future <laughs> that's a good question um some days i think the ship is going down some days i think academia is going to disappear but we had the pandemic and the first thing that happens is everybody signs up for graduate school. Numbers are up yep. this year for graduate mm -hmm. school. And that could be, I think that's currently the way we think about the labor market. I think, I think going back to school is a lot of people's answer to a period of unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, 
you know, that just may be there's, it's almost like, I think of it from a religious studies perspective that education is almost like a cultural religion, you know, that when we don't know what to do as a culture, it's, you turn to much like, you know, when, when, when people become more religious, when they face a tragedy in the same way, we become more education focused when we face a labor tragedy, maybe, I don't know. Okay. Um, I, I don't know. There's a whole, there's more I could say about that, but I think, yeah, I think part like part of me wonders if academia is going down and it's certainly going to change. There are a lot of institutions that are hanging on by a thread, especially after the pandemic. So I think we'll probably see um, I've seen some recent estimates that they think anywhere as, as high as 20 percent of institutions in the U.S. could close. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to be true. They're they're nope. they need to be creative. Um but I think what I hope for higher ed, um, and like I said, I'm not really angry about it anymore. So I don't necessarily want the ship to go down, um, especially taking all those um, great students with it. I think what I would like to see is a transformation of the way we think about advanced degrees. And it's kind of coming back to what I said at the beginning, um, that if professors want to keep teaching these degrees, they could do it and feel good about it if they're actually preparing their students for great careers after, you know, and there may be some degrees that it's hard to justify doing for an all tech career. So maybe we shorten those ones. I don't know, maybe an English PhD. I'm just picking on English, but maybe that <laughs> takes, you know, two, two years instead. I mean, I know in the UK, the PhDs are just three years, so that might be a better option anyways. No, three or four um, depends on your funding scheme, but yeah, they are shorter. Yeah, right, right. But they're shorter. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that, that sort of evolution, I would love to see it happen. And frankly, the only thing that's holding it back is these kind of archaic attitudes that people have about academia. And in particular, mm -hmm. that kind of, it's it's just this like weird, like I'm going to call it European because I think that's where it comes from. But like this elitism that academia has to be, you know, that it's any, t any talk about jobs is crass. And I get people yelling at me about, you know, if I'm teaching people, they telling people they need to get jobs about neoliberalism and all this like, Come on, like people it's, need to it's eat. It's not very and... neoliberalist to pay your bills. I exactly. Think <laughs> well, maybe it is, but I think it's universal. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there was a time in history when the ideals of the university were forged, when the university was primarily for upper class people who were going mm -hmm. to, you know, kind of get quote unquote finished, which is I think what they called it in England, right? Was was for to be finished or finishing, finishing school? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that university or is that a lower grade? I forget. But I think that's like at, at an even lower age. It's I mean, lower, yeah. I mean, let's let's the finishing school for women was a lot different for for men as yeah. well. But I mean, we were pregnant yeah. by sixteen. So right, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so the the yeah the way the way that we've been trained to think about university is the vast majority of thing you know the vast majority of kind of the historical disciplines of the university you you were crass if you even thought of getting a job outside of the kind of respectable professions like doctor and lawyer which we still do teach at a university for some reason mm -hmm. um and i think that just comes out of like european social norms from hundreds of years ago so i think the university needs to change. It needs to transform if it wants to survive. I read a, f a book a few years ago, ago called Change or Die. And um, <laughs> it's, a, it's probably, yes, and it might even have some behavioral science implications. But um, essentially, it was looking at people who'd had heart attacks and they told you have to eat healthier, or you're going to die. And most people couldn't do it. They couldn't change oh. their behavior like that. And I think the university is in a similar situation that I know it's not going to be an easy transformation. But I think and if for nothing else, just out of decency, um, the people who are running advanced degrees need to have open, honest conversations about what they're for. And if they prepare their students adequately for life after, they can actually feel good about themselves as opposed to, you know, assuming that their students are all failures because they didn't get tenure track jobs and that I, I don't know. I don't know what imposter syndrome is like among professors, but I can only imagine some of these supervisors who all of their bright students disappear into contingent lecturing and out of academia. I can't imagine that's very good for their self esteem either, right? Yeah, so, some, like survivor's guilt or something. Yeah, <laughs> some, exactly. Yeah, like why are you training all these people and they just don't go to where you think they should be, right? Um, what? Yeah, that's a different conversation. But anyways, <laughs> the point. The point is, I think the university can transform. And my biggest message is that PhDs can do fantastic things outside of academia. They can build amazing careers. And all we need to do is change this, like change the conversation and change some things structurally. But, 
And we could help them do that. And you could have an academy that actually fits within the 21st century and might actually see the 22nd century. So I think that's my kind of takeaway is that I would like to see it transform. Um, otherwise, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I honestly don't. Um, so that was the question about where the university is going. What was the other part? Where do you see alternative uh, academia going? I think maybe more as a concept, because alternative academia is, of course, a very wide range of a large yeah, amount of jobs. It's anything, really. Yeah, alternative yeah, academia, yeah. I guess, is anything that's not academia. Um, well, I, I hope even if the university doesn't change, I hope more and more people understand that understand what they can do with their degrees. And I think one of the things that I really like about what I do is that I can give the information straight to people. I don't have to try to change the structure. I can help individuals change. Um, it's kind of that structuralism versus agency kind of paradox um, <laughs> that I, I can just give information right to people and they can choose what they do with it. But I think, I think if nothing else, I think that helps to change change the dialogue too. So I think that's uh, that even just doing that can can sort of move the needle, and I think can change a lot of ind individuals' outcomes. If not, you know, even if it's not changing the whole academy. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I, Chris, I think your vision is is one that I very much would love to see come true, and and hopefully it will. Hopefully, you know, the pr the natural pressures of yeah. the external world will force you know, people to change or die. Um, <laughs> it sounds so harsh. It sounds so harsh. But I'd rather change or die than publish or perish. Yes. Because yeah. that type of culture is, oh, no, get me away from that. Um, and I think but yeah. there's a really hard question that is it, that an institution that is routinely ruining people's lives. Does it does it deserve to does it deserve to stay alive? You know, no, so no, it does not. it's the really hard answer <laughs> is that yeah. maybe the academy deserves to die unless it's willing to change. And that's a hard, a hard truth. And I, you know, I won't get into that now because I know we're done, but that's, that's a question, <laughs> a question to take away is like, why does this institution deserve to survive given the things that it does to people? Wow. No, yeah, that's, that's an, that's an eye opening question. That's, a, hmm. <laughs> and on that note, maybe on we that just, cheerful note. Yeah. Yes. On that impending doom um, <laughs> with, with a, with a hint of optimism, uh, Chris, thank you so much for you know taking the time to speak with us today um before before we go if you would like to plug any of your things that you've got going on direct people uh, listeners to something to check out after this episode please feel free yeah well check out the website roostervane.com um there are a ton of blog posts there all the i think most of the resources you would need to kind of get started um however we're actually creating we've we've created kind of a set of courses that we're launching pretty soon so we're calling it the rooster vein academy ironically um <laughs> but it's it's basically a, a course about networking about how to use linkedin all that sort of thing um we've tried to make it there's a cost because there's of course a cost to putting these of together course. but we've tried to make it pretty reasonable so it would be accessible to students um and institutions can buy too so if, if you want you can and pressure your institution to buy it instead but um yeah so that's kind of what we have going on and that's what what's going to be going yeah over the next year you can find me on twitter cj cornthwaite which is my weird last name of my initials um, on link linkedin <laughs> anywhere I'm, i have a youtube channel too so just search for rooster vein and you'll you'll find me perfect as always perfect. everything will be linked below chris thank you so much for your time thank you i really enjoyed this conversation excellent Okay, so that was our conversation with Chris. Um, very interesting, <laughs> very candid at the end, but also very refreshing. I really enjoyed getting his perspective on on everything. Mila, what was your uh, what was your your takeaway from the conversation? That there's still hope. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think he, he's been very kind. He's been very honest. Um, you, you can see that he's definitely been disillusioned, <laughs> uh, hmm. just like us. Um, but he, he's still very optimistic and just very much like, you know, you, if you go about the PhD a bit more strategically, there's just nothing you really cannot not do. Where, you know, I mean, policy work, research work, these are still areas, especially where, you know, if you tune and tweak a bit how you represent the focus of your PhD, then you should be all right. And uh, I mean, for, for the both of us, you know, given the topics that we study, I, I don't think we'll have a very hard time tweaking the focus of our PhD to sound interesting or applicable to, to mm -hmm. industry. 
I mean, you've already had an internship with an industry, so you definitely did not struggle. Um, I work with corporate data sets, so I don't think I should be struggling that much either. So it's 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 good to know. It's good to know that even after you've gone through the entire disillusionment and you've you've seen the very often rather toxic environment that academia can be, given that it's trying to pump in 40 PhD students who then oh, have to figure out how to divide four jobs amongst themselves. I mean, surprise, mm-hmm. 90% won't get a job. That's, that's just a simple mathematics, at least not in academia. And it's just, it's just refreshing that someone who's been through it would just adamantly say, this does not work. <laughs> At all. And it is, uh, I, I share his surprise of the fact that it's still going, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, there's not many incentives for, you know, the people inside the system to change it because they've benefited no. from it. Um, mm-hmm. It's really going to have to be a, a pivot uh, when the business model becomes unsustainable. Um, and trying to get institutional change is often, it feels like, Bang your head against a brick wall, um, so it 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 will have to happen eventually. There will have to be some evolution, but I'm not sure whether or not it's going to be evolving in the ways that we would like it to. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know whether it's going to mean they're going to take on less PhD students, especially if that's a profitable business model. Um, I do think the WBS has recently written up, so this is oddly specific, but they have had several meetings with some of our student representatives from the from the PhD, from several cohorts, and they've drawn up a new plan for hiring PhD students, and um, they increased funding per student, but then also said as a result, but we're going to cap the number of students, which I think they're, from what I could read from what the WBS would fund, they halved it. And I was like, yes, finally, because my cohort, which was just the business and management section, I think has 35 people in it. There's wow. not 35, there isn't even 35 jobs like postdocs within the area that we are in. Like not, not even just at this university, but like at most universities in the UK combined. So why would you hire that many people? Um Especially yeah. given the fact that they have to pay us, so it's not it's not even from a greed <laughs> perspective, you know. Yeah, so and I, I, I'm glad this is, this is actually landing. Yeah, that I mean that's that's a really good development. I mean, I think you can rightly say that you know people making these decisions aren't naive to the no. fact that there aren't enough academic jobs for the amount of people that are being trained for them. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just that. The way that the PhD as a program is structured means that, you know, the default is assumed that you will go into academia. Like that is all the training is built around Mm -hmm. that end goal. Um, That's the coaching that you get. That's baked into the advice that people give you about, you know, how to construct your CV or how to network. It's just Mm -hmm. ingrained. It's like the implicit assumption. Um, and I, I do think that there are exceptions to the rule. I mean, like with our funding body, um, the ESRC, there I see that they make a massive effort to organize internship programs, you know, to organize a ways in which you can, you know, get experience um, that is going to lend itself more to a job outside of academia and help yeah. them to bridge the gap. But it's still, it's, you know, there is a default. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is an implicit assumption, uh, mm-hmm. and and that is what I, you know the the academy is built off of, um, for better or for much worse. But um, yeah, I I I just one of the big takeaways I had from from this conversation was that really you are the master of your own destiny. Like this mm-hmm. PhD is yours to make it whatever you want it to be, um, and it is possible to do a PhD and develop skill sets that are going to lend itself really well to a job, you know, in consultancy or public policy or NGO. But you have to have that vision. (laughs) You have to know that that's a possibility in order to take the steps to develop your skills in the PhD that are going to be what these careers are looking for, you know. So 
it's possible. We just need we just need the vision and the foresight and, and a bit a bit of actual strategy. You know, not, not mm. just mocking about, but an actual cohesive, coherent, yeah. effective strategy. Yeah, yeah. More mentors, more mentors who've actually made the transition from a PhD to an alt career. That's that's yeah. what I want to say. But there we go. I think I think that's a good note to end on. I think that that's a good summary, a nice optimistic summary of what we've just been through. So guys, as always, everything that has been mentioned in this episode will be linked down below in the description box of whatever platform you're using. Chris, thank you so much for your time. Dear listener, also thank you so much for your time. We hope it was a entertaining, educational, thought-provoking, or hopefully at least interesting episode for you. And as always, we hope you have a great week. And we hope to see you again next week. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. You're the one I love. You're the one I want to